This program and its contents are designed for information and educational purposes only. This program does not render medical advice or professional services and is not intended to be a substitute for professional care. The information provided here should not be used for the purposes of diagnosing or treating a medical or psychiatric condition. If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, consult your health care provider. My name is Mike Hubanks, and today we're here to talk about Alzheimer's disease. If you would have asked me 10 years ago about Alzheimer's disease, I would have told you that it is the old timer's disease. It affects people in their final stages of life, a horrible disease that impacts the very elderly. I was very ignorant about the disease. Five years ago, I was an executive at Diversified Financial Services in Omaha. Diversified is an agricultural equipment finance company and insurance company. We finance and insure center pivot irrigation systems and farm equipment. Diversified is headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska and owned by the Lauritsen family. I started my career with Diversified in 1998 as an entry level credit analyst. After substantial company growth, an acquisition, and a merger, we had grown from 28 to 126 people. I am by nature a very ambitious, very outgoing. I was also able to climb the corporate ladder quickly, but then I was working for an outstanding company. In 2004, I was promoted to Chief Operating Officer and Senior Vice President. By 2010, my role was that of one of three executives. I was the chief operating officer. I managed HR, IT, customer service, project management, and general operations. My job was very demanding, and it was high stress. It required daily multitasking, very quick judgment calls. I was also involved in civic organizations. Before moving from rural Iowa to Omaha in 2009, I served on the Oakland Community School Board, and then after reorganization of schools on the Riverside Community School Board. In 2000, I was elected to the Iowa State University Extension Council in Pottawatomie County, and I've served on church boards for over 30 years. In 2010, I was a divorced father of three, juggling family, community obligations, and work. We were still suffering from the financial crisis of 2008. It took a toll on our business. I had to facilitate the closing of one of our offices, which impacted over 30 employees. The high point during this time was at the end of 2010, in December, when I remarried. In 2011, while continuing to deal with a very high stress job, the lasting impact of my previous divorce, poor health, I had a stroke. I had high blood pressure, I was overweight. The stroke was in the left lateral medulla in my brain stem. I recuperated very quickly in the hospital and was actually back to work in a week. Over the next several years, my job stress was still there. I still had other things that during my, during my normal life, during my, my typical day, were very stressful. I had two more TIAs, or mini strokes, over the next two years. I knew before 2010 that something just wasn't quite right. I was having some memory issues, short-term memory issues, but more importantly, I had forgetfulness. I was having increasing difficulty making decisions. My multitasking skills were diminishing quickly. I was pushing my doctors for answers. I knew my job performance was suffering. In January of 2010, at the recommendation of my internist and neurologist, 
I had a neuropsychological exam to rule out memory loss and to put to rest my fears that something was seriously wrong. The neuropsychological exam is an exam, a test that actually lasts over three hours. With the results of the neuropsychological exam, my wife Deborah and I met with Dr. Pere at Methodist Hospital. The results. Intellectual testing is estimated to be in the high average range. So I had retained my intellectual, the intellectual side, but in 1976, when I had an IQ test, my IQ at that time was 155, and we knew that this was diminishing. Weakness was also shown on all areas of visual and verbal memory functions. Speed of information processing. Results show multiple areas of weakness surprising for the limited amount of cerebrovascular damage from the stroke. A neurodegenerative process needs to be ruled out. I had no idea what a neurodegenerative process was. The immediate diagnosis, mild cognitive impairment, or they call it MCI, and short-term memory loss. This was not good news, but it was kind of what we had expected because we did know something was wrong. So I was almost convinced that whatever was wrong probably was not related to the stroke. By May of 2015, after a very stressful week, on a Friday night, I collapsed. I couldn't swallow, I couldn't talk, and had deficits on the left side of my body. I'd had another stroke. They later called it a significant neurological event, but it did not leave any permanent damage as far as blockage in blood vessels. However, the MRI did show slight brain atrophy, which at the time I didn't understand what slight brain atrophy meant. I know today that means that my brain is slowly dying. It was now determined that the mild cognitive impairment and memory issues could not have been caused by the stroke. In June of last year, I went on short-term disability and was referred to a specialist. After an initial consultation with the specialist, a spinal tap was ordered. I later learned that this test would be required for me to qualify for long-term disability. Spinal fluid test looks for two things. It looks for amyloid beta, a protein fragment that forms plaques in the brain, and for tau, a protein that accumulates in dead and dying nerve cells. The spinal test lab work alone was $1,800 and not covered by my insurance. It was also not covered by the disability insurance company that required it for the diagnosis. That was a surprise. On August 14th, my wife and I sat in Dr. Daniel Merman's office at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. The test came back positive for both amyloid beta and for tau. The diagnosis was in younger onset Alzheimer's disease. I was 58 years old. I don't think you can ever really prepare yourself for news like that. But I definitely was not prepared for what came next. We asked what the treatment would be. Give me the pill. Give me the fix. It was then that we learned there was no cure. I was shocked at the reality also shocked how uninformed I was about this disease until it became personal. Alzheimer's is the leading cause of death in the top 10 in America that cannot be prevented, cured, or slowed. One in three seniors die with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. Alzheimer's is the sixth the leading cause of death in the United States. Two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's disease are women. 
my spinal test results, though positive, were borderline, which was good news, meaning that we caught it early. The stress of my job, combined with the memory loss and the mild cognitive impairment, and with the results of the spinal tap, meant that I could no longer work. I would no longer be able to complete my job functions. So I was forced to take early retirement. I later learned the difference between early stage Alzheimer's and younger onset. Younger onset means that you were diagnosed under the age of 65. There are roughly 200,000 Americans that are living with younger onset. Early stage means that you are in the early stages of the disease, regardless of age. I am both early stage and younger onset. My wife asked the next question of Dr. Merman. How aggressive is this disease? The answer to my wife's question was very sobering. In a two to, few, two to four year window, I could be able, unable to care for my own basic needs. In a four to six year window, I could be dead. The key words here are could be. Alzheimer's progresses differently in different people. We knew this was the worst case scenario. Well, we had our answer. We knew what the diagnosis was. We knew what we were dealing with. It wasn't good news. In September last year, Diversified gave me a retirement party. I was thankful for the 17 years that I had at Diversified. I was very passionate about my job, about my three children, my new wife and her two children, and of course our 12 grandchildren, soon to be 13. After the initial shock of the diagnosis, I knew what I was not going to do. I was not going to sit at home and die. I needed to funnel my passion for my job into something else. I went from working hard at my job and worrying about what was wrong with me to now sitting at home staring at the walls. Less than a month after the diagnosis, I started volunteering at the Alzheimer's Association. The best resource that we have available to us in our community is the Alzheimer's Association. My first role was that of a peer support volunteer. That means I talked to others when they first received their diagnosis. It seems that it's a good idea to have a resource for someone to talk to that's already been there. I've already had the diagnosis. My wife and I have been privileged to speak at numerous support groups over the past few months, sharing our story. We've appeared on two Omaha TV stations during their news segments to talk about our life dealing with a diagnosis. I want to educate and help others as they try and navigate through the same diagnosis that I had to. My passion is younger onset. There are just so many things that the public doesn't understand or that they do not know about getting a diagnosis before you are 65. Short-term, long-term disability is not a requirement for employers to carry in the state of Nebraska. I was fortunate to have that coverage. We started the process in October last year, filing for Social Security disability, and were approved in February. Healthcare coverage is important. I'm now on COBRA. My healthcare is $1,400 a month. Part of my job was human resources at Diversified. I understood Social Security, Disability Insurance, COBRA, and the Fam Family Medical Leave Act. We did speak with an attorney, and they estimated it would cost us in excess of $10,000 in legal fees to navigate through these processes. There were just too many surprises as well as things that really were not disclosed timely in regard to Social Security disability and long-term disability. We still have to deal with the diagnosis itself. Medication, 
I'm currently taking a medication called Aricept that helps with my thought processes. And of course, I'm living with short-term memory loss, with mild cognitive impairment. The impact this has on spouses, and in some cases, children that may still be at home for those diagnosed with younger onset. Within two weeks of my diagnosis, I started a blog. I wanted to document my journey. My blog is omalz.com, and it's made me realize how much people need support when they're going through this. I've heard heart-wrenching stories from people who have sent me comments, people that were fired from their jobs, dealing with the stigma of Alzheimer's, family members that have abandoned them, a husband whose wife was diagnosed in her 40s with teenage children at home. The stories are too many and too sad. I was recently approached by a publisher after reading my blog. We are currently working on a book. My hope now is to enter the national stage. I was recently nominated and have started the interview process as a candidate for the Alzheimer's Association National Early Stage Advisory Group. This is a select group of 10 individuals throughout the country advocating for awareness of Alzheimer's disease on the national level. The newly diagnosed need an avenue to talk. Whether it be on the phone, through a peer-to-peer -peer support program where they can talk to other people that have been diagnosed, or support groups that meet periodically. Caregivers also need a support system. The caregivers are our unsung heroes. We attended an early stage support group recently that met for the first time, and the message was clear. They need a good support system that is made up of both the diagnosed and caregivers. I've jokingly said before that I am the new look of Alzheimer's. I don't fit the stereotype. This disease has or will impact every American, whether it be a parent, a spouse, or other family members. On many occasions, I've asked the audiences when I speak how many people in the audience know someone that has Alzheimer's disease? And almost every hand will go up. My life today consists of writing my blog, speaking at events, enjoying my Cavalier King Charles Spaniel Max, and living every day to its fullest with my wife, Deborah. I can no longer multitask. Deborah has to take care of our finances now. I have to plan ahead. Every night I plan for the next day. I remember I had lunch at the governor's mansion back in November. I can't remember how I got there, and I don't remember what the menu was. I remember classmates from high school and college, but I can't tell you what I had for lunch yesterday. If we pick out a movie from our DVD collection to watch, we will probably get almost all the way through the movie before I realize that I've seen it before. If I go to the grocery store to get four items, by the time I get there, I will have forgotten at least one. Five years ago, I could have given a presentation like this from memory. Today, because of my memory, I have to read it. In a recent interview with Heather, Heather Riggleman from the Kearney Hub, she asked about my faith. I told her that my first instinct was to ask, why me, God? Instead, after much soul searching, I asked, okay, what next? On December 30th of 2015, I had a second neuropsychological exam. The results were not, were not good. Compared to the results of the prior evaluation, a decline is observed on multiple areas of cognitive functioning, including most tests measuring visual, 
and verbal speed of processing. Deficits of attention span. Deficits in working memory. Deficits in multiple aspects of memory functions. Performance is technically declined on confrontation naming. Results are showing multiple areas of impairment. Results continue to be indicative of multi-domains mild cognitive impairment and now we know the cause to be Alzheimer's disease. I am an advocate for the newly diagnosed. Not everyone with this disease is able to speak in public like I am to talk about how it impacts them. As long as I am physically and mentally able, I will continue to do what I can to raise awareness about this horrible disease. Whether I'm in Kearney, Grand Island, Lincoln or Omaha, Chicago, Illinois or Washington, D.C., I am very passionate about this cause. In the time that we have spent together today, every 67 seconds, there is one more person that will develop Alzheimer's disease. That's 50 people every hour. That's something that should scare all of us. This is something that should get all of us involved in trying to find a cure. Thank you for your time today. My name is Mike Hubanks. I'm 59 years old. I have Alzheimer's disease. <laughs>